everyone. Welcome to MGI's Economic Insights webinar. Our topic today is the consumer demand recovery and lasting effects of COVID-19. And that's the title of our new report at the McKinsey Global Institute, or MGI as we like to call it. MGI is the business and economics research arm of McKinsey. And at McKinsey, we help organizations across private, public, and social sectors create change that matters most to them. I'm Anna Bernasek, and with me today are two authors of the report, Jana Remes and Sajal Kovli. Jana and Sajal, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Anna. Let me tell you a little bit about Jana and Sajal. Jana is a, a partner at MGI based in San Francisco. She's an economist and leads MGI's work on growth, health, and urbanization, among many other areas. Sajal is a senior partner at McKinsey based in Chicago, and he leads McKinsey's global retail and consumer package goods practices. So Sajal and Yana are gonna speak for about 30 minutes. And during that time, uh, we do have some polling questions that are gonna pop up and we'd really love to hear from you on those. We're gonna have about 15 minutes at the end for questions. So please send me any questions as they come up. And if you could use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I'll do my best to get to as many of those as possible. Now, any technical difficulties, please use the chat box and we have our tech experts standing by to help. Um, finally, at the very end, we do have a super brief three question survey that we really hope that you would stick around and just fill out for us. But I think most of all, we just hope you'll really enjoy this session. So Jana and Sajal, over to you now. Thank you, Anna. Well, uh, and thank you to everybody who's joined us from all different time zones. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Uh, so let me just, uh, at the opening, just talk a little bit about this body of work. Obviously, it's been an unprecedented consumption shock. If you just think about what's happened in the pandemic, both personally and for society writ large. And what we really tried to examine in this body of work was what happens once the pandemic is over. And if you really step back from this research uh, and that we go through in, in a lot of detail, Yara and myself, and we'll tag theme through this conversation, is maybe four or five key takeaways. And the first one really is, is uh, you know, there are reasons to be optimistic uh, about a pretty robust consumption recovery, but it's going to be exceptionally uneven. And, you know, how sticky will be the pandemic-induced behavior change is really what we examine in this report. It's also true, we looked at nine different segments in society and we looked at five different countries, so China, France, Germany, the UK, and the US. And we believe the recovery is going to be pretty uneven as you look across these segments based on age, income, et cetera. In general, the US seems to be recovering much faster, but a little bit more uneven when compared to, for example, UK, Germany, and France. What we've really seen is quite a different mosaic of behavior changes. Some that we saw pre-pandemic have got massively accelerated, and we'll talk about that. There are others that have been materially and quite seminally reversed. And the others, there are some that are more temporarily changed and reversed, and we'll see how they, whether they play out or not, and whether they stick or not, and we'll, we'll share some of that uh, in this report. What's also clear from a perspective of companies and different players in different industries is that between companies and governments, that intersection is going to define in large part what's going to happen to different consumers and consumer behavior as we look across different segments. So with that, let's get into the detail. Uh, Jana, over to you. Thank you, Sajal. So let's start by a look of the fundamental economics of what's happening with consumer purchasing power in this crisis. And this is a very different recession than most of the ones that we have seen in the past. We don't have the usual asset bubbles bursting or debt overhang behind us. This was very different. It was, um, keep going. first of all, it was much deeper, it was faster and it was service-based and all of these matter for the prospects for the recovery. So when you compare, for example, to the Great Recession of 2009, it was orders of magnitude larger. In France, for example, the drop in consumption was 17% versus one. It ranged between 10 to 25% in the countries that we looked at. It was much faster, it happened in two quarters instead of four in Germany, for example, similar pattern elsewhere. And most 
uh, importantly, potentially, it is, was a service-based downturn. UK services dropped by 30% as people weren't able to dine out, travel, or go to even hairdressers or the usual kinds of, if you want, affordable luxuries that most people maintain throughout the downturns. So, for example, in the US, 90% of the decline in consumption came from services, while in the Great Recession, it actually was fully on goods. And this matters because it really changed the prospects for recovery, and I give some of the reasons for optimism. First of all, services are where most people work. About two-thirds of uh, workers in most uh, developed economies work in services. And they were the ones who were the hardest hit. So we saw a pretty dramatic uh, drop in employment levels. But the um, stimulus support by governments maintained purchasing power and thus consumption on many of those uh, low-income consumers. So when you look at the size of the stimulus, it was very large, from 6 to 39% of the GDP in our country, 6% in China, even in China, 39% in Germany, and somewhere in between 20 to 30% in US, France, and, and Germany. And that meant that actually the disposable income decline was basically stable. UK was the only country where the disposable uh, income actually declined. In the US, it actually increased by 6% across the board, simply because of the fact that the stimulus more than uh, compensated for the drop in, in labor income. And this then meant that, uh, so that the lower income consumers have been able to make their consumption. Many high income, particularly white color workers, actually didn't lose their jobs. They moved to working from home, maintained their income, and weren't able to spend and that meant that they actually really dramatically dropped their consumption, which typically is a lot on services. So when you look at what happened over 2020, and here we have looked at the segmented view and, um, of the consumers, both by age, on, from younger to older consumers, and then by income from low, middle, and high income. And unlike most other downturns, you actually saw low income consumption over the year increase relative to 2019, while it was the high income consumers who dropped their consumption more. They were the ones who weren't able to spend on, uh, on, on services. And as a result of both of these patterns, something that you normally don't see in downturns is a massive increase in savings. You saw doubling or 50% increase in savings in across the countries that we looked at in the in US and Western Europe, and even 10% increase from already high level in China. Just to take the U.S., more than doubling the average household savings from 2019 to uh, 2020 means that households now have 1.6 trillion more dollars in their savings that, that they, they, they planned for based on their previous savings behaviors. And that was largely because of the fact that they maintained the income and weren't able to spend. So that this is one of the examples of why we are optimistic for the recovery. There's lots of purchasing power. We saw what happens in China after some of the health concerns uh, abated, and we were and they were very quick to bounce back, particularly on the services side. And when you look at the overall consumption prospects, it is um, we are quite optimistic that we'll see recovery, as Sajal already mentioned, faster in the United States a little bit slower in Germany and France, and I think biggest uncertainty is that in the case of the UK. And what we show here is on the gray shaded um, area is the range of scenarios for real consumption recovery. The blue one is the nominal one. So depending on what you what you care for, you can see both of them. But we expect a kind of consumption recovery in the 20, 2021 range in the US and between 2021, 2022 in the real terms in, in the other countries. But as a subject, this is going to be quite unequal because of the fact that the stimulus funding is no longer going to be supporting uh, the lower income household purchasing power after the programs end. So when we look at the same nine consumer segments, you can see that the likely kind of, if you want four, four years ahead perspective to 2024, we are likely to see quite uneven consumption recovery, especially so in the US. And one of the reasons for our concern, particularly for the low income working age, younger and working age consumers, is that the pandemic actually made a lot of changes in businesses on their digital automation, et cetera. That means that some of those jobs that were lost may not come back or will come back in a very different manner. And that might slow down. Simply the adjustment of shifting jobs and retraining will may change things um, uh, as we look ahead. But overall, 
more faster uh, growth, but more uneven in the United States in a, in a few years' time frame. Most even in Germany, where the, actually the stimulus funding was strong and early. And actually, you will see the, perhaps the least difference amongst the older consumers who spoke income, uh, who, whose income was less directly impacted by the downturn. So this is kind of the fundamental economics, but expectations matter. And so we'll start talking about what we are hearing consumers say on what they are doing. And let's start with a poll. So you will start now seeing on your screen a poll, and we would love you to respond to that. What is your overall confidence level surrounding economic conditions after the COVID-19 crisis subsides? Um, as an economist, expectations matter especially because of the fact that it's not only how likely I am to be careful on my spending, but also for businesses who are thinking about where to invest. So we will be all uh, watching what the consumers are doing, mostly because it will influence business decisions and some of the more cyclical, cyclical side of, the, um, of when, the, when we should expect the recovery to happen. So should we be ready to see some of the results already? You haven't voted last last five seconds for you to, to respond and then we'll show you the results. Shall we see the results, please? Probably not very different picture from what uh, what we are seeing when we are talking more broadly. And so, Dal, may I pass it over to you to tell us a little bit of what we are hearing in our polling of the consumers? Yeah, no, it's it's, it's actually eerily similar to what we are seeing in a consumer sentiment. So, just just uh, for for folks who just uh, uh, can you go back a couple of pages, Anna? Uh, is is I think if you if you go back and you think about uh, maybe one more, Yara, that'll be really helpful. Uh, uh, one more, two more forward, sorry. Uh, forward, yeah, the other way. Right, uh, one more. That's it, thank you. So uh, listen, I'm, I'm not gonna drain this slide, but you know, we, what we wanted to do here is array the countries. Uh, we've been obsessing about consumer sentiment ever since the onset of the pandemic in about 42 different countries, and we kind of update this every you know two or three weeks. And, and maybe just to, you know, I, once you download the report, you'll get to see this in more detail, but just a few highlights. Uh, in general, uh, the U.S. more optimistic than the European countries, but less so than India, China, or Mexico. So China and Mexico and India indicate some of the highest levels of optimism around econ economic recovery. Having said that, we've seen a meaningful uptick since November 2020 in the level of optimism from a consumer sentiment standpoint. The European countries, if you just dig into that cluster of uh, geographies a little bit more, are exhibiting less optimism than the U.S. Uh, so, for example, the optimism you know, between U.K. and France increased, but even since November 2020, increased between 13 to 7 points uh, ever since November, which is actually a meaningful uptick. One reason we believe uh, for this lack of you know, robust optimism is just the, the, the pace at which vaccine rollout is taking place in Western Europe, as an example. That being said, we think the most fundamental takeaway here is that growing optimism is translating into increased expectations for consumer spending as we go forward. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so what does this really mean? And you know, lots of folks are using all kinds of terms, but we just call it you know, splurge spending intentions. And Yana had talked about the different segments, which you can see here from a generational perspective and then sort of arrayed and cross-referenced with different income levels. So if you just kind of step back from, from this chart a little bit, <clears throat> the high income and younger individuals and households, those households are most likely to spurge on themselves in 2021. And we are seeing this actually across geographies. Uh, but given the high level of accumulated savings, actually unprecedented level of accumulated savings that Yana had talked about, amongst the higher income households, there's a massive potential for releasing this pent up demand, uh, which is quite indicative of what we think will be a strong economic recovery. Now, obviously this changes by segment. So depending on you know, who's in the audience and if you're you know, thinking about which 
consumer segments you actually target, you do have to get quite granular about what the recovery will be and where the splurt spending will come. Uh, so to, you know, to understand the shape of demand, we once again surveyed consumers about what they plan to spend on, like where is the spending and splurge spending really going to happen? So if you can go to the next page, please. So, uh, you know, as the, so when we even look, you can kind of see the different rows here between restaurants and dining at the top end and all the way to fitness, sports and outdoors. So from a splurge spending, we actually expect, uh, much more spending to happen in what we call pandemic restricted services or what I loosely call discretionary spend categories, such as in restaurant dining and travel, but also categories like apparel and beauty and personal care. As you poll consumers, and we've been, as, as I said, we've been refreshing this every two or three weeks, the consumers tend to spend much more money on in-restaurant meals, out-of-home entertainment, you know, travel apparel, footwear, they're all sort of 25% higher in terms of intent in a post-COVID environment versus what the consumers were telling us during the, 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 the heyday of the pandemic. And this was as late as February. The timing of the service spending will actually depend much more on pandemic resolution and vaccine rollout, which is pretty intuitive. But we found that about 20 to 30 percent of anticipated, you know, this flood spending that we we're just talking about, the spending plans are dependent on consumers receiving vaccines, while an additional 10 to 15 percent is really dependent on consumers and this families receiving vaccines, just so people feel like they're in a safe place before they uh, actually exhibit these spending levels. And once again, to connect back to a slides, few, a few slides back, the pace of vaccine, the more recent pace of vaccine rollout in the US, again, indicates a pretty positive demand story. And you see a little bit of a different picture, for example, for obvious reasons in, in Western Europe. So this was a little bit about the consumer sentiment writ large, as we've been looking at it from across 42 countries and multiple geographies. We then said, let's actually go and take a deep dive in five or six different sectors. And if you can go to the next page, please. So we looked at e-grocery, home nesting. You'll see the five or six sectors that we looked at. These sectors in general broadly represent about 75% of spending from a consumer perspective. And they were all meaningfully impacted. And we all as consumers were meaningfully impacted if you look at these three or four areas of spending uh, from a personal standpoint. Uh, but across all of these cases, and we'll go through uh, these with some highlights in a second here, but we saw a few things. Number one was a massive acceleration of some trends like digitization. You see that in e-grocery, you see that in virtual healthcare, and we think those are going to be quite sticky. There was a second bucket of trends that we just call interrupted behaviors, like remote education. We all, those of us who have kids know what they've been through in terms of remote schooling, uh, leisure air travel, I mean, you know, airports are ghost towns as we speak, uh, and entertainment, in-person entertainment. So those were sort of the interrupted behaviors. And then there was a third bucket that we'll just call reversing other long-standing habits, like, you know, the time and frankly money that you spent away from home. So this whole notion of the home body economy was a pretty important reversal of long-standing uh, habits. But let's go through uh, uh, some of these uh, in a little bit more detail. Could we go to the next page, please? <clears throat> uh, actually, before we do that, uh, one of the things that we, you know, we, got, we get a lot of questions as we were sort of embarking on this research was how many of these trends are actually going to stick post pandemic. And we came up with what's called the stickiness test that Yana's going to walk us through. And after that, we'll get into the specific deep dives into these six sectors. Go ahead, Yana. Thank you, Sajal. Uh, it is very clear that everybody is asking now, what do consumers want? And based on our pretty long-standing look at what happens after big changes in the economy, it, it is not only what consumers want, what's going to determine what's going to stick. And that's why we looked at both the different dimensions of the consumer decisions and experience, as well as what the industry and companies are doing, as well as government. Because what consumers want is actually oftentimes less important for the long-term impact than what are the actions on the industry and government side. So let me talk a little bit about this stickiness test that we think applies, that we applied, and we'll talk to you about the six cases that Sajal mentioned, but you can also apply to your own sector cases as you think of how much do you think some of you, the changes you have seen in your markets might change. So let's start with the consumer angle. Obviously, consumers 
the, the behaviors that create a lot of value for consumers are clearly the ones that are more likely to stick. People who were able to use digital health for those easy to use over video, for example, they really enjoyed it. Uh, many consumers who were first time e-grocery users, they chose the buy online, pick up in, in store because of the fact that it saved them money. Value is one, one dimension. Experience, was it actually a good, good experience for you? Education, as Sajal said, was one of the great exceptions where we didn't see digitization or change to online be a positive experience. In most other cases, we saw consumers like them, especially the boom, baby boomers who could have lived the last decades of their life without adopting some of their digital behaviors. And they were now, they had to, they were not to try and they liked it. The third one is asset commitments. That's something of people don't often think about. When you have invested on a home gym or when you have invested on a Italian coffee maker or uh, a nice home office, you are much more likely to continue to, uh, to continue that behavior. So looking at these components give you a good fact base for assessing how much of the consumer is going to push for a, a stickiness of the behavior. However, the choices the consumers face will depend on what the companies will offer. Many industries responded quickly. So for example, some of the movie studios decided to stream directly to consumers when they couldn't launch their, their big box uh, things in, in movie theaters as movie theaters were closed. Similarly, many other places, you saw gyms go online, you saw restaurants providing offerings. So the innovation on the enter, uh, enterprise side is probably going to be one factor that's going to shape where consumers are going to be. Industry structure also matters. Some businesses were much more ready to, for example, deliver good quality, timely, reliable e grocery experiences than others. Discounters in particular were in a harder position because they didn't have the deliveries necessarily there yet. So industry, this is going to be a space that is going to be very important to watch as we, as we look for the sticky behaviors. And last, government policies. This is where typically we see the biggest shifts. You saw that after the energy crisis of 1970s, the regulatory changes were the ones that changed the global economic energy intensity in the long term. In our cases, we are watching at digital healthcare. How is the virtual healthcare services reimbursed or regulated in the, let's say, national healthcare systems? That's going to be very important of what doctors recommend and what options are for, for, for patients. In the case of economic policy, some industries were supported with strong stimulus packages. National Airlines was one of them, or, or major airlines. Small, independent entertainment venues were not, and that puts them into a very different position in terms of their capacity to maintain the growth going forward. So let's see what we, what we learned on the six cases that we looked at. Um, first, on some of those rebound cases that Sajal mentioned, our education, as we know, it's going to go pretty quickly back with some innovations. But in leisure travel, for example, we expect people to have a very strong demand for that. However, because business travel is going to be much slower to recover, it has traditionally done so. Companies have been looking to reduce business air travel because of cost and climate reasons. So we and many others expect business travel to actually permanently decline by 20% from its previous uh, growth path. And as a result, this will have spillover effects to the choices that leisure travelers have. Some routes, some destinations might no longer be available because their flights are no longer subsidized by the more profitable business travelers. And also, um, you might actually see some business, uh, some business class seats be translated into offerings to the people willing to splurge for a more convenient travel option. So we're probably going to see some, some changes on the leisure travel options that consumers are going to see, and that's going to shape where and how people travel. So that's one example. So Joe, would you like to tell us something, and uh, a few others? Yeah, sure. Let's go to the next page, please. So uh, one of the things we thought we should do is just also examine, you know, uh, e-grocery here for a second. I'll talk about e-grocery and, and also about home nesting. So just to step back, in general, grocery is actually a 2 to 3% EBITDA business, but unprecedented surge in demand just given the nature of the pandemic for grocers actually across the world. So now, while grocery, e-grocery, or you know, digital and omni-channel uh, enabled grocery was uh, you know, a, a trend that we were watching quite closely pre-COVID, it massively, massively uh, accelerated. You, know, you saw a lot of uh, new influx, you saw an influx of new business models, you know, curbside pickup, click and collect, et cetera. 
So just in July, 30 to 50% of the total US online grocery shoppers were actually new users. These were folks who actually wanted to go to stores, but actually now have discovered the convenience of online grocery shopping. Largely driven by baby boomers, but also low income household adoption actually drove the surge. And we think this is gonna be quite sticky. But, but just to examine this a little bit, uh, pre-pandemic, the rough online penetration of grocery was about 4% in the US, just as an example. There's been a significant investment in click and collect and delivery capacity in 2020. You know, folks, you, you know about all the delivery, uh, uh, different uh, you know, delivery providers that you all use as consumers. We expect this digital penetration to actually triple and settle at between 10 to 12% as vaccines are fully rolled, rolled out, which is a 3x increase pre-pandemic in one year. The way I think about this is we've had online penetration you know, in, in 12 months, what we didn't see in the last two or two, two and a half decades, which is actually quite important. What this has also done for e grocery players is actually created margin compression because you now have to spend much more time, money on, and cost structure has changed because of fulfillment costs, et cetera. And from a consumer perspective, we are seeing a very strong preference for click and collect versus delivery for a bunch of reasons, you know, consumer experience, service uh, uh, failures, et cetera. But what's also quite fascinating, and this is the industry structure point that Yana made, the industry structure is also changing because we are seeing a pretty prolific emergence of what we call instant commerce or convenience. And there are several players around the world that have emerged to tap into this changing consumer sentiment and behavior. Maybe with that, uh, if you can go to the next page, I'll talk about home nesting a little bit, which is another very important trend. So, you know, you can see the numbers here, but they're actually quite dramatic. Uh, in terms of, you know, at home increase, consum consumption increase from 9% to 18%, which is a pretty big shift, as you can imagine. You know, 57% increase in video game sales. But that's also because, you know, the, the center of gravity of consumer life shifted quite materially during the pandemic. And we think this is going to be pretty elevated even after, you know, this health crisis actually abates. Uh, we saw, you know, all kinds of categories, household appliances and furnishings were up you know, 10 and 12 percent uh, in June of 2020, just as an example. Lots of uh, consumer spending in DIY projects. So just to give an example, Home Depot uh, in the U.S., their app usership increased by about 88 percent from January through November. Uh, you know, and that's about a two and a half X increase if you just look at how the consumers are, you know, tapping into DIY. And then this trend was actually mirrored quite similarly in home exercise, right? By time, time spent on a Peloton, for example, was up 1.7 times, you know, and I don't know how many of us are fitter and feel leaner and, and more robust, but it's kind of what the, what the consumer was doing. And about, you know, 30%, so about a third of the consumers indicate pretty material and permanent changes in how they work and how they actually study. So, you know, these two trends give us a sense of the first set of behaviors that I was talking about, which is a pretty massive acceleration and an interruption and a reversal of long-term habits. With that, let's go examine the next two. Jana. <clears throat> let me let me just uh, array these uh, because uh, so if you, if you look at these these six subsectors and you overlay them on the stickiness test that Yana was going through. You kind of see a very a mix of sort of many different tales, uh, and, and it's quite bifurcated on the two bookends, at least on these two, uh, these six, six subsectors that we looked at. So remote education, leisure air travel, maybe less business travel and entertainment, we think is not going to stick. So these behaviors were temporary, they were interrupted, but we think they're going to be a pretty uh, meaningful snapback to what we used to experience from a consumer behavior standpoint pre-pandemic. On the other hand, e-grocery, virtual healthcare, and home nest nesting are going to be pretty sticky in the longer term. And this is pretty important because how companies that are in these spaces actually go to market has materially changed. And that's just a very, very important thing. Uh, uh, you know, from a resource allocation standpoint, where do you actually invest if you're an e-grocer? Should you actually invest in physical footprint versus technology and your dot-com and omni-channel? go to market strategies how should you think about the gig economy does that give you you know some sort of a relief from a you know just a pure cost structure standpoint if you're going to enable e-grocery so some pretty meaningful choices 
And maybe the last point I'll make here is that the window of opportunity for companies to respond is not going to be that long. Lots of market share is up for grabs. And the agility with which companies actually respond will shake out the market shares and the positions of the different players, depending on country, uh, but especially, for example, in you know, e-grocery as, uh, as one of the uh, deep dive sectors that I was talking about. Uh, so, you know, in, in maybe in conclusion, if you go to the next page, please, and then we'll go to Q&A. <clears throat> Maybe uh, three key takeaways as we've been you know, uh, diving deep into this body of work. Uh, the first one to remember is optimism, recovery imminent, but it's going to be a segmented demand recovery. It's very, very important to underscore that point. It's not going to be equal across the nine segments, for example, that we spoke about and we looked at. Uh, the second is given which part of the economy you're operating in uh, and which subsector, You've got to think about the legacy of pandemic behavior. Is this going to be seminal, permanently changed? Is it interrupted? And how quick will the recovery be? Or is this acceleration? It's very important to come to terms with that as you think about your forward-looking plans. Uh, the third for me, uh, maybe there are two points in the emerging innovation. One is externally. We should anticipate in all of these sectors a significant uptick in just innovation metabolic rate, in terms of new business models, how you go to market, how you capture the imagination of the consumer. That's externally facing. Internally facing, I think it's just super important for companies to almost give up the notion of annual planning and long range planning. We think the planning horizons are gonna get much tighter and there's gonna be a very significant spotlight on how nimble you are when it comes to resource allocation and that's CapEx, human capital, you know, cash reserves, all of that. Because this, this thing is still not settled. And so companies will have to be incredibly agile in how they respond to these challenges uh, uh, and opportunities. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, we just wanted to give you a highlight of the report. I'm sure you download it. And you know, if, you, if you are so keen to go more into detail, and with that, I'll hand it back to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sajal. Thank you, Yana. Um, if you could all submit questions now, we have a few coming in. Um, and while you submit questions, I just wanted to let you know, uh, this report about the consumer is part of a trilogy at MGI that we've published. The first uh, report was on the future of work that we published about a month ago. Uh, the consumer report is the second report. And then the third report is out today on uh, the future of productivity and growth after the pandemic. Uh, we also have um, the release of a number of McKinsey Global Consumer Sentiment Reports planned, uh, April through July, and we have a report coming out on the future of Asian consumers. So there's a lot going on, and we hope you'll uh, look out for those. Um, on the, the questions, um, I think the a number have come in. Uh, I think, Yana and Sajal, you spoke about um, e-grocery but actually a number of the audience have asked if you could talk about the future of retail in general and maybe Sajal you could jump in on that and particularly a question about will retail move towards a sort of Alibaba model a kind of blending of online offline commerce through digitization of the entire retail value chain could you speak a bit about that please Oh, it's a terrific question, and uh, you can imagine, given what I do for a living, I'm obsessing about it all day long uh, with my clients and, and the folks that we serve. So uh, maybe you know, let's just take e-grocery as a jumping-off point. There are four or five things that have that are quite meaningful from a future of retail perspective. The first one is the flight to digital and the flight to online is going to be exceptionally sticky, and we saw that in e-grocery, but we are seeing that across categories. Uh, you know, whether it's discretionary spend, staples, uh, home categories, beauty, apparel, et cetera. That's number one, which is a very, you know, so the, 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 the proverbial promise of tomorrow of omni-channel is here now. That's number one. Number two that uh, a lot of folks don't uh, speak about is there has been a massive shock to loyalty. The number of consumers that have tried new channels and new brands during the pandemic has really shaken up the whole loyalty uh, uh, rubric, if you will, because companies have been investing in it for years because retention economics really drives retail businesses, but that's up for grabs. And that would mean rethinking how you think about your marketing, 
your personalization just from a retail perspective. Uh, so that's the, the that's the second one, and the third one is we we, we envision, uh, and this is connected to the question and you know the part of the question in Alibaba. We think if you look at the the average balance sheet of a retailer or their cash position, given where the consumer is going for them to respond, they are basically not big. They're not going to be able to support the funding required to put in the investments to respond to that change in consumer behavior. And therefore, we think there's going to be a very high surge in alliances and partnerships and consortiums in the retail industry. So if that's true, you know, digital disruptors and large ecosystems like Alibaba, or if you think about you know, Google, or you think about Rappi in Latin America, uh, or you think about you know, JD, or you think about you know, Amazon and Walmart, Retailers like that that have really built ecosystems that tap into very different margin pools versus just selling products and services are going to grab a bunch of share and going to become mega companies in our view in the next four or five years. So there is pretty unprecedented industry structure shifts that are quite imminent. Okay, terrific. Um, I th there were a few questions on retail, but I think actually you, you answered all of those, Sajal. Thank you. Um, we might move now to Yana and home nesting. And this is actually one I, I was surprised at when I first uh, saw the findings. Uh, a member of the audience, Yana, has asked, why, why will home nesting remain? Because aren't we all sort of craving to go out and leave the home behind? Great question. And I think there's a number of answers. And the most important one is working from home. It is true that about 40 to 50% of US and European country uh, workforce can work substantial amount of the week from home, from two to five days in total. And the pandemic really enabled both the workers as well as the companies to prove that it is actually feasible to get a lot of things done at a distance. And that's going to mean we, we estimated about one day a week more working from home on average for those workers who can do so. And that's a pretty substantial shift in time spent. And the important thing is that a lot of workers really enjoyed the fact that they didn't need to commute, the time they had back, the capacity they were able to exercise, whether it was in a peloton at home or walking outside. We saw all of those behaviors be not just taking a lot more consumer time, but be really enjoyed by, by the folks who were at home. So because people can work from home and because they have made their home more comfortable, we expect that there's going to be a, a uh, acceleration, if you want, or reversal, a slowdown of the previous trend of spending all of your time outside. Of course, this doesn't mean that people won't go back to restaurants and go back to travel and visit their friends. They will. But compared to the trends that we were previously, we will very likely spend more time at home because we are not commuting, because we are not traveling as much for business, and because of the fact that we now have, let's say, a bigger screen TV and we are going to watch more movies at home rather than in the movie theaters than we did before. So it's not a dramatic shift. We are not going to stay in a pandemic mode, but we have shifted from the previous path. And I think a lot of people enjoyed what they did at home more. So it creates new opportunities for businesses who are who, who have products and services for the home. And I can add just two more things to the last question, because I was just looking at the Q&A and there are a bunch of questions that are really mm -hmm. fascinating and we can go hours on this. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there, there was one set of questions. I think what's, it's, it's also important to note that, especially in developed markets, the basis of competition in retail because of the pandemic has shifted from product and price to privileged insights and experience because of the consumer behavior. And so we're going to see, you know, and that's just important to acknowledge because that means data becomes the currency for competition and for market share gains. You know, any two players in an industry, if they have more privileged insights about the consumer and actually can be much more personalized in what they offer, have a lot to gain. I think that's one. There was another question around Brazil and Mexico. Mm -hmm. It's a great question of why there's optimism. I think if you look at the countries that are showing much more optimism, I think, and Ayana will correct me if I'm wrong, but most of these countries, their demographic profile actually skews much younger. And if you remember, the younger households are the ones where we saw much more optimism uh, when we looked at the nine demographic segments. So that's at least potentially one reason. Terrific. Um, 
there are some questions on on travel and i wonder if uh, e either one of you would like to to take it over in terms of um whether we see the sort of splurge on travel spending will be a short spike or sustained boom for a longer period i think we, this is up uh, it's pretty clear that one surprise for me on this study was that i expected older consumers to be much more cautious of coming back but this is actually not what our surveys show. They show that baby boomers are extremely keen back to get back to traveling and enjoying their, their, their retirement years. And many of them actually have saved more last year. So we expect that to come back with, uh, with the boom. And I don't see that ending anytime very soon. There may be some changes as a result of the choices they have, but there's no reason to see travel, leisure travel demand declining because it is the demographic trends income trends this is an increasing trend and it's a long-term trend that we have seen and the consumers are saying that they have a pretty substantial pent-up demand so we might actually see some upscaling splurging in the near term where that's going to end up it's going to be partly a function of where the prices and the offerings are going to going to range but um, definitely i think what i am definitely optimistic given what we see on the finances as well as the survey results from the consumers and the bookings Great. So, John, anything for you to add on that? Or? No, I, I, I completely agree. I think it's going to be tough to forecast. I think the question is how long will that sustain? I mean, we mm -hmm. think uh, we think this is very, very imminent, right? And, 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 you know, if you talk to the epidemiologists at McKinsey, you'd say as soon as you sort of you approach some level of herd immunity, you're going to see a massive uptick in, in leisure travel. And my personal view is that this is going to sustain for a while. This is not just a, you know, one spike in splurge spending and then it's gone. I think this is going to because because of the savings rate uh, issue that uh, Yana talked about earlier. Okay, terrific. And um, one question to you, Yana, just in terms of when you look at the the consumer recovery, um, what are what are these sort of uncertainties that we really need to keep in mind? Uh, you know, we 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 are looking at potentially a fourth wave in in the virus. I mean, what are the things that we we need to keep in mind? In the near term, two things matter. One of them is what, what's happening with the pandemic. What are the new variants? How effective the vaccines are? How quickly we get vaccines out? That's critical. The second one is the economic support from the government that's particularly sustaining the consumption of the low income segments. So those are the private priorities. Lives and livelihoods. We have another series of reports, by the way, where we look at that and update. And I would, and we are definitely tracking that very closely. Beyond that, the big uncertainty is what's going to happen to new job creation, particularly on the services. On one hand, we have the pressure for automation. I saw a question somebody asking, it is true that we have seen everything from food, food processing plants to uh, fast food restaurants automate, go online, and some of that will stick. It's not a poor, uh, in, in some cases, we are going to see a reversal back, but in many cases, accelerated and automation, and that will slow down jobs growth. On the other hand, we see a lot of new innovation, new kinds of jobs, and actually business starts have been up in many parts of the world as people have taken the moment of reflection and started to think about what to do. It's a moment of innovation, as Sajjal said. So it's going to be, I'm, we are watching the near-term pandemic and the economics and the long-term competition between automation and innovation and new job creation. Thank you. Thank you both. I'm so sorry we are out of time, unfortunately, and there are so many great questions. Really appreciate it. Um, we, uh, I had a question about where can I find the report? We have a slide, um, I believe, that has the QR code on it for the report. Um, and we also have a great interactive that goes along with the report. So we hope that you would explore that. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we do have the three question brief survey at the end. Um, if you don't mind just filling out, that would be fantastic for us to get some feedback. Um, and, you know, hope you enjoyed it and, and thank you so much.